Okay, so good afternoon, everyone. My name is Yelena Yezhova. I am a software engineer at Marantis. And uh, I'm Oleg Bondarev, senior software engineer at Marantis. Today, we're going to talk about Newton performance at scale and find out whether it is ready for large deployments. So, why are we here? For quite a long time, there has been a misconception that Neutron is not production ready and has certain performance issues. That's why we aspired to put an end to these rumors and perform Neutron focused performance and scale testing. And now we'd like to share our results. Here are some key points of our testing. First, we deployed Mirantis OpenStack 9.0 with Mitaka based Neutron on two hardware labs with the largest one having 378 nodes. Secondly, we're able to achieve line rate throughput in data plane tests and boot over 24,000 VMs in density test. And finally, and that's the major spoiler by the way, we can confirm that Neutron works at scale. But let us not get ahead of ourselves and stick to the agenda. We shall start with describing the clusters we used for testing, their hardware and software configuration along that with, with the tools we used. Then we'll go on to describe the tests that were performed, our results we got, and their analysis. After that, we'll take a look at issues that were faced during testing, as well as some performance considerations. And finally, we'll round out with the conclusions and outcomes. So we're testing Mirantis OpenStack 9.0 with the Mitaka-based Neutron with MO2 OVS plugin. We've used VXLAN segmentation uh, type as it is a common choice in production. And we're using DVR for enhanced data plane performance. As to hardware, we're able to experiment on two different hardware labs. The first one had 200 nodes. Three of them were controllers. One we used for running Prometheus with Grafana for cluster status monitoring, and all the rest were computes. Here, as you can see, controllers were more powerful than computes, all of them having standard Intel 82599NIX <coughs> uh, controllers. Now, the second lab had more nodes and had way more powerful hardware. It had 378 nodes. Uh, again, three of them were controllers and the rest computes. As I said, these servers were more powerful than ones on the first lab as they had more CPU, RAM, and what's important, they had modern Intel X710 NICs. Now, a quick look at the tools that were used in testing process. All the tests that we were running can be roughly classified into three groups, control plane, data plane, and density tests. For control plane testing, we're using Rally. For data plane testing, we're using a specially designed tool called Shaker. And for density tests, it were mostly our custom designed scripts and as well as heat templates for creating stacks. Prometheus with Grafana dashboard was quite useful for monitoring cluster status. And of course, we're using our eyes, hands, and sometimes even the sixth sense for tracking down issues. So, what exactly were we doing? The very first thing that we wanted to know when we got our deployed cluster was whether it is working correctly, meaning do we have internal and external connectivity? What's more, we needed to always have a way to check that data plane is working after massive resources, creation, deletion, uh, applying heavy workloads, etc. The solution was to create a so-called integrity test. It's quite simple and straightforward. <laughs> we create a control group of 20 instances, all of which are, are located on different compute nodes. Half of them are situated in one subnet and have floating APs assigned, when the other half are located in another subnet and have only fixed APs. Both subnets are uh, plugged into a router with a gateway to an external subnet. So for each of the instances, the, we check that it is possible to SSH into it, ping an external resource, Google for example, and ping other VMs by fixed or floating IPs correspondingly. 
uh, lists of IP to ping are formed in a way to check all possible combinations with minimum redundancy. Having VMs from different subnets with and without floating IPs allows to check that all possible traffic routes are working. For example, this check validates that ping passes from a fixed IP to fixed IP in the same subnet, from fixed IP to fixed IP in different subnets when tr packets have to go through the Q router namespace. Uh, from floating IP to floating IP, when traffic goes through the FIP namespace. And finally, from fixed IP to floating IP, when packets have to go all the way through the controller. This connectivity check oh, is really super useful for verifying that data plane connectivity isn't lost during the testing process. And it really helped us to track down that something went wrong with data plane quite early on. And now I'd like to pass the ball to Oleg, who will tell you of control plane testing process and results. Yeah. Thanks, Elena. So for uh, control plane tests, we, as Elena said, we used Ready, and we ran three types of tests. So first one is basic neutron test tube. It's actually a, a set of API tests, like gradient list subnets, networks, routers, etc. This doesn't include uh, VM spawning. Uh, this uh, set of tests goes with Rally itself, so we didn't uh, modify test options much. The main purpose of this suit is to validate cluster operability. <coughs> uh, secondly, we ran uh, hardened versions of both tests, which increased the uh, concurrency and the uh, number of iterations. Plus, we added some tests which actually spawn VMs. And finally, we uh, ran special uh, two tests, specially targeted to create many servers and many networks in different proportions, like many networks with one VM in each, or less number of networks with uh, uh, many VMs in each. Uh, OK, speaking of results, uh, for basic neutron test suite, there is not much to say, actually. As I said, it's just a neutron API tests. And from the graphs, we can see that there is no big difference between average and max response times, which is positive. Uh, so uh, this uh, set of tests were ran, were ran with uh, concurrency from 50 to 100 and from 2 to 5,000 iterations. Uh, so create and list are additive type of tests where resources are not deleted on each iteration, so the load and cluster grows uh, from iteration to iteration. Uh, also, we added three tests which are actually booting VMs, where the most interesting is uh, boot and run command delete. So as it not only creates server and uh, it only verifies that it has uh, that floating IP is working and that it is accessible for floating IP at uh, all at high scale. Uh, so as for results for the highlighted tests, uh, we we were all the tests were successful with no failures, and we see that on a more powerful lab, the response times are better, which is expected. So for this uh, boot and delete server security groups and boot run common delete, we faced some issues initially on a 200 node cluster. Uh, I won't talk about issues. I, I will talk about issues a bit later. So now I can say that after investigating and applying several fixes on a more powerful lab, we were able to run the tests without any failures, even with a greater concurrency. OK, speaking of trends, uh, I can say that for create and list networks, we see slow uh, linear growth for create network and uh, as well for li linear growth for list networks operation, which is uh, kind of expected uh, because the more resources we have, the more time neutron server needs to, to process. So it's even better for create and list routers. As you see, it is a stable response time for create router, not dependent on the number of resources, and uh, really slow linear growth for this router. 
So uh, pretty much the same result is for creating these subnets. It's uh, slow linear growth in both cases. Ah, yeah. Uh, creating these ports, here is an aggregated graph, also gradual growth with uh, some peaks. Uh, the peaks, are, I believe, are related to some side effects on the cluster during the, during the test. Security groups. Uh, there is uh, actually something to investigate and profile in uh, uh, least security groups. As you can see, it's not quite linear growth, so there is something to look into. For create security groups, it's pretty stable response time, not depending on the number of resources. Uh, So-called uh, rally scale with many networks. So with this test on each iteration, uh, 100 networks were created with one VM per network. And we did uh, 20 iterations with concurrency three. And as you can see, it's really slow response time increase. And uh, even better for rally scale with many VMs, where uh, one network per iteration, and each network has uh, 100 VMs, and as well 20 iterations and concurrency three. See that it's pretty stable response time. So we should have probably do more iteration, more iterations and concurrency, but we were very, very limited in time, so and had to give priority to other tests. Uh, just like with this talk, so uh, I'll pass the ball to Elena, and she will speak about shaker and data plane testing. Thanks, Alec. Okay. Shaker is a distributed data plane testing tool for OpenStack that was developed at Mirantis. Shaker wraps around popular system network testing tools like iperf3, netperf, and others. Shaker is able to deploy OpenStack instances and networks in different topologies using the heat. Shaker starts lightweight agents inside VMs that actually execute tests and report the results back to a centralized server. In case of network testing, only master agents are involved, while slave agents are used merely as backends for, in, for handling incoming packets. There are three typical data plane testing scenarios. The L2 scenario tests the bandwidth between pairs of VMs uh, in the same subnet. Each instance is deployed on its own compute node, and the test increases the load from one pair until all available computes are used. Uh, the L3 East-West scenario is the same as the previous one, with the only exception that pairs of instances are deployed in different subnets. And in the L3 North-South scenario, uh, VMs with master agents are located in one subnet, while VMs with slave agents are reached via their floating IPs. So, our data plane performance testing started on a 200 node lab deployed with standard configuration, which also means that we are using standard MTU, which equaled 1500. Having run the Shaker test suite, we saw disquietingly low throughput. In east-west bidirectional tests, uh, upload and download each were almost uh, 500 megabits per second, which is uh, rather low for a 10 gig NIC. So, this result suggested that it might be reasonable to update MTU from default 1500 to 9000, which is a common choice in production installations. By doing so, we're able to increase throughput by almost seven times and it reached about four gigabits per second each direction in the same test case. Such difference in the results shows that performance to a great extent uh, depends on the lab configuration. Now, if you remember, I was telling that we actually had two hardware labs, we, where the second lab had more advanced hardware, and uh, most importantly, more advanced Intel X710 NICs. What's so special about them? Among else, these NICs allow to make more full use of hardware uploads that are especially needed when uh, VXLAN segmentation with its uh, overhead of 50 bytes comes in. 
hardware floats allowed to significantly increase throughput while reducing load on CPU. Now let's see what difference does advanced offloads capable hardware make. Uh, on the 300 plus node lab, we ran shaker tests with a different lab configuration. We experimented with MTUs 1500 and 9000 and turned hardware floats on and off. As it can be seen on this chart, hardware floats are most effective with small MTUs, mostly due to segmentation of floats, in fact. So if you compare columns one and two, you will see a three and a half times throughput increase in bidirectional test. And an increasing MTU from 1500 to 9000 also gives a significant put, uh, boost. So if you look at columns two and four, you will see a 75% throughput increase. The situation is uh, uh, the same for unidirectional test cases as well, well downloading our example. Here, hardware floats give uh, two and a half times throughput increase. And looking at COMS 2 and 4, you will see that combining enabled hardware uploads with enabled jumbo frames helps to increase throughput by 41%. Uh, these results prove that it makes very much sense to enable hardware uploads and jumbo frames in production environments whenever possible. So here are some real numbers that we got in this lab. We're able to achieve near line rate throughput in L2 and L3 East West tests with concurrency over 50, which means that there were more than 50 pairs of VMs sent in traffic simultaneously. So we got 9.8 gigabits per second in download and upload tests, and in bidirectional tests, throughput each direction was over 6 gigabits per second. Now, Let's compare the results we got in a 200 node lab that had less advanced hardware with the results we got in a 300 plus node lab with more advanced hardware. On this chart, you can see how average throughput between VMs in the same network uh, changes with increasing concurrency. On a 300 plus node lab, throughput remains line rate even when concurrency reaches 99. Almost the same situation is with the L3 East-West um, download test when the VMs in different subnets are connected to the same router. Here it can be seen that running the same test on a lab with enabled Jumbo frames and supported hardware floats leads to sufficient increase of throughput that keeps stable uh, even with high concurrency. Uh, L3 North-South uh, performance is still far from being perfect, mostly due to the fact that in this scenario, even with DVR, all the traffic still has to go through a controller, which inevitably gets clogged. Apart from that, uh, the resulting throughput depends on um, many factors, including switch configuration, lab topology, meaning are the nodes located in the same rack or not and MTU in the external network, which in fact must always be considered to be no more than 1500. The results of bidirectional tests, I think they are the most important, as in real environments there is usually traffic going in and out, and that's why it is important that throughput remains stable in both directions. Here we can see that on the 300 plus node lab, the average throughput in both directions was almost three times higher than the 200 node lab with the same MTU uh, equal 9000. And uh, in fact, the average results that we, that we were showing on the previous graphs are often affected by some corner cases when the channel gets stuck and throughput drops significantly. To have a fuller understanding what throughput is achievable, you can take a look at this chart with the most successful results, where upload, download exceeds 7 gigabits per second in each direction on a 378 node lab. So, uh, to sum this up, the data plan testing has shown that Neutron DVR plus VXLAN installations are capable of very high, almost line rate performance. There are uh, two main factors though, hardware configuration and MTU settings. 
This means that to get the best performance, you need to, uh, to have a modern hardware flows capable NIC and enable Jumbo frames. But even on older NICs that don't support all hardware flows, uh, performance can be improved drastically, which the results that I got on a 200 node lab clearly show. Uh, their north-south scenario, however, uh, clearly needs improvements, as uh, DVR is not currently truly distributed. And in this scenario, all traffic um, goes through the controller, which inevitably gets flooded. And now, Oleg will tell you about density testing and share probably the most exciting results that I got. Right. Uh, so, with density test, we aim three main things. So, first of all, boot as many VMs as the cloud can manage. Uh, secondly, not only boot, but ensure that uh, each VM got uh, external con got connectivity, got wired up and got connectivity. And thirdly, uh, verify that data plane uh, is not affected by high load on the control plane. So essentially, the main goal was to load cluster to death, <laughs> and to see the limits, and to see where are uh, the bottlenecks. And uh, yeah, additionally, of course, uh, check what happens to data plane when the control plane breaks. Uh, we only had a chance to uh, run this density test on a 200 node cluster. Uh, just to remind about the hardware, it has uh, uh, three controllers with uh, uh, 20 cores and uh, 128 gigs of RAM and 196 computes with six cores and 32 gigs of RAM. Uh, additionally, one node was taken for uh, health monitoring using Prometheus and Grafana. Uh, okay, so about the process. Uh, for the first version of uh, density test, we used HIT. And uh, so one hit stack uh, means uh, creating one network with a subnet connected by a router to the external network and also spawning uh, a VM per compute node. So it's uh, uh, actually 196 VMs uh, per stack. Uh, upon spawning, each, uh, each VM should uh, we injected a script which uh, upon spawning VM uh, fetches its uh, metadata and send this metadata to the external HTTP server. Uh, thus, uh, the server actually controls that uh, all VMs respond successfully, all VMs were able to get metadata and uh, get external access. Uh, so we spawned hit stacks in the batches of one to five. Uh, most of the times it was five, so uh, one iteration basically means uh, up to 1,000 uh, VMs being spawned uh, almost sim simultaneously. Uh, uh, between iterations, we ran integrity check by actually executing connectivity. Connectivity check, which Elena described earlier, so to make sure that the uh, data plane of control group of VMs is, is still okay. And uh, also, uh, during during the test, we were constantly monitoring Grafana dashboard uh, to be able to identify and probably fix, mostly identify uh, any issues with the cluster at uh, early stages. Uh, I will talk about issues a bit later. Now about the results. Uh, so it was three or maybe four days journey with over 10 people involved from different teams, and finally, finally we were able to spawn 195, uh, 125 hit stacks, which is over 20, 24,000 VMs on this cluster. Uh, we faced uh, several bugs in different projects, and uh, yeah, one, one important note is that uh, we never lost data plane connectivity of the control group of, of VMs. So uh, this is uh, how one of Grafana screens was looking during the test. This is uh, close to final iterations. So it has, uh, it, it, it is showing uh, CPU and memory load, also load on database and uh, on network. Uh, these are, by the way, aggregated graphs for controllers and computes. So as for memory usage, uh, you can see that uh, it is, uh, Close to end uh, 
on computes while staying pretty stable on controllers. Yeah, here are the peaks. They correspond to batches, batches of VMs being spawned. Uh, yeah, that's okay. And this is how CPU and memory load changed uh, during <coughs> during our test. So as you can see, we almost reached uh, memory limit on compute nodes, which we expected to be actually the limiting factor. But we had to stop the test a bit earlier because, because of the issue we have, which we used in our deployment. So first we uh, faced a bug which, uh, with a max number of allowed bits per OSD node. So this is some safe stuff. And uh, after this, self monitor started to uh, restart and consume all, if not more, resources on controllers. So causing all other services like Rabbit and OpenStack services to suffer. Uh, after this failure, we were unable to recover the cluster even with the help of our test team. So we had to stop the test even before the uh, resources on compute nodes were exhausted. Uh, one pretty important note that even when cluster, this cluster went crazy, we still got 100% success for data plane connectivity test for control group of VMs, which, which is quite exciting. Okay, as for other issues, at some, at some point we had to increase our table sizes on computes and then on controllers. So then we had to increase uh, CPU allocation ratio on computes. It's actually a novel config, which is controlling how many virtual CPUs can be spawned on a compute node, depending on the number of uh, real cores. Uh, several bugs in Neutron. Uh, most interesting is a uh, poor create time increase with uh, uh, a scale. This, is, this was related to DVR and actually was fixed by a two lines patch and quickly upstreamed and backported. Uh, backported to Metaka, I mean. Uh, so, another interesting um, issue which deserves attention is the uh, obvious agent restart on a loaded compute node, which has a lot of VMs, because sometimes agent may time out while reporting active. Uh, active interfaces back to server over RPC. So this is a well-known issue, actually, which has, I believe, two alternative approaches to fix, two, al two alternative patches, and just need to reach consensus. Uh, and also messaging bug, which affected us pretty much and took some time to be investigated and uh, fixed by our messaging team. So this was related to Agents reporting their states to, to the queues consumed by nobody. Uh, also, bug in Nova, which when you delete a bunch of VMs, like a hundred of VMs at once, Nova computes may, may hang, and after some time, VMs are started to be deleted, but still you see in Nova service list, you see computes are offline, and this was actually also fixed. So the bug is, uh, is related to NOAA interactions with Ceph. Uh, yeah, I believe that's all regarding the issues. So, and finally we can, after our tests, uh, we can say that uh, main outcomes are that no major issues were found with Neutron. So all issues that we found were either already fixed in upstream, and maybe we just backported them, some we fixed ourselves and uh, upstreamed and backported. And one, one is uh, in progress, as I said, with alternative approaches to fix. Uh, so rally test did not reveal any significant issues with uh, Neutron. In fact, the, there were no uh, threatening trends in rally test results. Uh, and the uh, data plane tests show pretty stable performance on all hard hardware. It was demonstrated that uh, high, high results can be achieved even with old hardware, just need to adjust MTU. 
and on modern har hardware with modern uh, network interfaces, even LAN rate performance can be achieved. Uh, yeah, again, important to note that uh, data plane for control group of VMs was never lost during, the, during our testing, all, all types of testing. Uh, the DST test showed that uh, it's a, uh, we were able to spawn over 24 KVMs on, on the cluster without serious performance degradation with just uh, three controllers. Uh, and uh, yeah, given the above, uh, we can say that Neutron is ready for large-scale production deployments on over 350 nodes. Uh, yeah, by the way, uh, the results and the process is uh, shared on OpenStack Docs, so everybody can, can go and check this. Uh, okay, that's pretty much all. We, okay, I will return to the previous slide so everybody can take a picture. Uh, that's pretty much all we wanted to share with you today, and we have, uh, I believe, some minutes for questions. Here is the mic, so if anyone has questions, please raise your hand and I will give his mic. Switch it. Okay. Do you hear me? Okay. So a question. Uh, 30 slides ago, um, I did not want to interrupt. <laughs> But on the subnet creation, port creation, um, it wasn't clear how many were creating and uh, what was the uh, throughput of creation of uh, ports or subnets? How many seconds or? Ah, not? Yeah, we did not include that, that result. Slide 22. 22. Like, like here? Oh, yeah, you mean yes. uh, what was the, the time of the whole test, right? How many were creating? I mean, is the 14, what, what is, uh, what, what's the scale here? How many, how many subnets you were creating per second? How, how much time did it take? Uh, yeah, this graph does not show this because we, we can't include all the graphs that Riley is able to, uh, to create. So, but we have uh, links to the Riley results where it can be seen, I believe. Here you can uh, build any graph you, you want to. Right, but what is the scale? Is this 14 seconds for a single subnet creation? Ah, okay. So this? Yeah, 14 seconds means that it is uh, the maximum time that got to uh, create a subnet during an iteration. Single yeah, single subnet. So you can see so some peaks at the end. So, so, so a few months ago in Open Network Summit, PayPal gave a lecture saying, you know, NSX doesn't scale beyond 2,500 compute nodes because of the control plane, right? Now, data plane, fine, you showed that it's, uh, uh, yeah, data plane, you showed that is a uh, um, line rate or near line rate, but if you're talking here about 10 seconds, 14 seconds to create a single subnet, I don't see how you're saying that's uh, production grade ready. So this was uh, uh, 50 or even 100 concurrent, uh, uh, concurrent uh, threads which were creating subnets. So it's not ser serialized. So it, uh, 50 or 100 concurrent threads. So how long did the entire, so this is 14 seconds for 100? No, this is 40 seconds for one. So you have uh, 100 threads, each creating a subnet, and the maximum uh, time that uh, some thread can, uh, in one thread was 14 seconds. Yeah, when you already have 2,000 uh, subnets created. Well, the the average. These graphs have not show the average, but I believe it's kind of five, maybe maybe four. Hmm? So you can see when their cluster is uh, not loaded with many resources, the average time is uh, well beyond one second. 
but when we have about 2,000 subnets already created, the average time is around two or three uh, seconds. Sorry, I, I, I may be a mistake a bit. So for create subnet, oh yeah, yeah, okay. <laughs> yeah, it's 14, the maximum time. Uh, could you please use the mic? Sorry, I thought I could speak loud enough. Um, were you able to determine what the bottleneck during these tests were? Was it RabbitMQ um, across the cluster, or was it uh, Python actually running, um, or was it the driver talking to Open vSwitch? So I, I believe if, if, we, if we didn't face this uh, self issue, I believe that we will uh, on a greater scale, we will run into RPC issues, I, I believe, in, uh, because the chattiness increases with the number of nodes. So this is one of big points, clearly, of, of this architecture. Thank you. Uh, could you yeah, give the mic over there? Uh, so what was the flavor of the instances you were using uh, um, for the data plane test? For the data plane, it was a special Ubuntu image which, which Shaker creates for its, for, for its tests, so with pre-installed iperf. So I believe it is the smallest Ubuntu image. Uh, did you also do any kind of tuning of netperf or iperf threads on the instances? Uh, I believe it was, uh, yeah, only one. We have a Shaker expert, actually, Shaker developer here, so I use his help. And did you also have to tune any of the Linux parameters for any of these tests for the data plane? Uh, I'm sorry? Okay. Sorry? Yeah, I'm sorry, could you repeat the question? Okay, did you have to tune Linux in any of these data plane tests for better network performance? Uh, we didn't. In the VM or on the compute nodes? No, the only thing that we did was enabling hardware floats if they weren't enabled by default and tuning MTU via neutron config files and increasing it manually on uh, physical interfaces. Okay, thanks. So there were no CPU pinning or that stuff. Thank you. Uh, there is another question over there. Um, so, what specific reason why you disabled native implementations for OpenFlow and OVSDP interfaces in Neutron? Is it performance issue? Uh, yeah, with native interfaces, uh, at the time we were testing this, uh, there was uh, a couple of bugs with uh, native OVS uh, OpenFlow implementation. Not sure about OVSDB, but that, that's how uh, most 9.0 deploys it by default. So. Until it's not tested, it, they are switched off. So, but, but I believe that in future versions, after some performance testing with uh, turned on OVSDB and OpenFlow native implementations, it should work. Uh, okay, if there are no more questions, we are out of time and uh, Thank you all for questions and for your time.